Well, good morning. Good morning. Are you glad to be here? Yes. yes. Me too. Thank you for joining us today. Those of you who are watching online, thank you for also joining us today. I want to share two verses from Psalm 19 as we begin. This is the Psalm of David. It says in verses 1 and 2, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. The heavens and the skies declare who God is and that he is their creator. And we are here to do the same and uh, praise God for the sunshine today. Praise God for the snow today because it reminds us of how much we look forward to spring coming. <laughs> um, we're glad you're here to worship with us today. We'll be singing praises to our God. We'll be gathering around the communion table to remember who God is, who Jesus is, what he has actually done for us and for this world. So we invite you to take part as we sing, as we pray, as we listen to the word proclaimed today, uh, as we collect offerings. Uh, offerings you can drop in the box uh, on your way out, or you can give online. If you're visiting with us today, we are very glad you are here, and uh, I'd like to invite you to, in your bulletin, fill out a connection card and drop that in that offering box or plate as you head out because we'd like to get to know more about you. And with that, let's pray as we begin. Our Father, it is a beautiful day that you have provided. We thank you for giving us breath and the breath and the life you've given us. We want to give back to you today. Father, may the worship that we offer be acceptable. May it be pleasing. May the fellowship of believers be something that is beautiful in your sight and that the world sees and responds to. We pray all this as we come before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we come to this time of communion, let's remember our Savior, the Son of God, who intentionally sacrificed himself to cover our sins and give us the opportunity to come near and have our sins forgiven and be the sons and daughters of the Most High. Let us continue our worship and adoration of the one true King as we become the righteousness of God.
prayer time this morning. Some requests in the book I'd like to share. Um, continue to keep Ron and Marion Murphy in your prayers, and it is good to see Ron here this morning. We are glad you are here with us, Ron, and we will keep lifting you and Marion up. Daniel shares his niece, Violet, uh, nine months old, is having surgery and will be in the hospital for a week, so keep Violet in prayer. Uh, Linda Swaggard shares her brother-in-law, Eric, uh, passed out suddenly yesterday. They don't know why, uh, so he's in the hospital and they're doing tests, so keep Eric uh, in your prayers as well. Let's go before the Lord together. Lord God, we, we come before you today. We acknowledge that you are the creator of all things. We know that you have always been and that you always will be. Even though we can't grasp what that is, we know it is true of you. Lord, you are unchanging and you are forever faithful. And so we are glad to come into your presence today. Father, we are so blessed to know you, to be able to praise you, to realize that you know everything about us. And though we are sinners, although we are imperfect people who could never live up to your standard, we praise and we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. He's our Messiah. He's the one who saves us. Our hope now and for eternity is in him and it is because of him. Lord, we are here to listen to your voice. We're here to hear your word proclaimed, to offer you true worship. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who is working in our midst, who is working in each one of us. Father, we pray for these needs that have been shared this morning for Violet as she undergoes surgery and recovery. Uh, protect her and guide those who are ministering to her. Be with Linda's brother-in-law, Eric, that they'd be able to determine what the issues are and would find a treatment and uh, complete restoration for him. We pray for Ron and we pray for Miriam as they go through uh, this phase of life and Lord we thank you for being constantly at work in their life in their marriage in their family Lord many many other requests that are probably in our midst today it may be for spiritual needs for hurts it may be physical challenges problems waiting for test results, the uncertainty that sometimes comes with that. Lord, even for emotional or relational type of concerns, Lord, you know each one. You know them very well, and you know the plan that you have. So Lord, we lift up the ones that we know, and we come alongside to be your hands and feet. And Lord, for the ones that we do not know, be at work in those and help us to be sensitive to the needs of those around us. Help us, Father, to grow in the knowledge of your truth and give us boldness to share the gospel with whoever you put in our path. We want to bring honor to your name and to the name of Jesus, your son. So. Lord, show us where we fall short. Show us the sin that we need to confess. Give us the strength to turn away from sinful ways, to turn from anything that does not please you. Remind us, Father, that our lives are in your hands and that we are never out of your sight. How reassuring, how comforting, it is to know that. Lord, we pray that you'd lead your church. Lead us. Lead your followers everywhere. And may we willingly obey and follow as you lead. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. morning, friends. Here at Meadowbrook, we practice open communion, uh, which means that if you are a baptized believer in Jesus, that you are invited, uh, in fact, you're commanded to partake with us as we participate together in participating in the body and the blood of Jesus. Um, There are going to be elements that are going to be passed in trays. Uh, There are also some prepackaged elements in the back. But as we head into this time of worship this morning, uh, I've been thinking a lot about clothes lately. Uh, one of the themes that we see throughout Scripture is actually one of clothing. Uh, we see it as early as Genesis chapter 2, where it says that the, the man and his wife were naked and they felt no shame. Uh, clothes today, we recognize, they cover up our, our nakedness, right? We, that's not something for everyone to see. Uh, But we see this come into the picture as sin made us vulnerable, as it imposed upon us a sense of shame. In response to Adam and Eve eating of the tree and taking sin into themselves, they sewed together fig leaves to cover themselves. Which, if you stop to think about, uh, how durable are those clothes going to be? Leaves don't last very long. Uh, They're going to dry up, they're going to wither quickly. Uh, It's not going to last. But one thing that we see God do in response, that after he imposes the curse upon the serpent and the man and the woman, uh, we see that God, in Genesis 3, verse 21, says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. In response to sin, uh, God made better clothing for Adam and Eve. I notice that none of us are wearing fig leaves, and I'm kind of glad for that. Uh, But maybe we don't wear leather as much anymore, but it's so much more durable. It's lasting, it's stronger. And so even though Adam and Eve were clothed by something that they had created, God made a better, lasting clothing. And if we think about how clothes are made, uh, you don't just get leather without there being bloodshed. And so here we get the first picture of death, of bloodshed, uh, the cost of sin and shame being covered. We get a very clear foreshadowing of the price to be paid on the cross to cover our shame here in Genesis 3. But not only is there a cost to be paid for our nakedness being covered, uh, but there's a certain way in which we're called to live because of the clothes that we're wearing. Last night, I had the the privilege of taking my two daughters to a daddy-daughter dance, which was amazing. And my girls spent hours getting their hair done, getting their dresses on. Uh, They were so excited for this opportunity. And when we got there, I recognized that there was a learning opportunity to teach them when we're in this type of formal setting. uh, There's a way that we behave. We don't take the silverware and pound it on the table saying, where's my food? Um... No, we we unfold the napkin, we place it on our lap, we sit still, um, we move eloquently, right? Based on how we're dressed, there's a certain way in which we're expected to act. This is no different than what we experience for us as believers in Christ. Uh, Throughout scripture, we see this idea of clothing and how we're supposed to act because of how we're dressed, Uh, Clothing representing our deeds. And we see that very clear. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked, when you were living in them. But now, you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off, taking off, the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. 
Here there is no Greek, no Jew, no circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. Right? There's something that we need to take off. Right? Adam and Eve needed to take off the fig leaves in order to be clothed with something better. In our exhortation in Christ is here in Colossians 3, put on then, clothe yourselves then, as God's chosen ones, uh, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all these, put on, be clothed with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We do see clearly there is a price to be paid. Genesis 3 gives us this clear picture that bloodshed to put on more durable clothings, the, the clothing that God provides. Uh, but there is a way that you and I are called to live now, being clothed in Christ, that we would put off the old self, that we wouldn't live as if we're playing in our old play clothes, our dirty clothes that my girls would wear outside playing, but rather we're dressed in Christ. And there's a way in which we're to live in imaging him to the world around us. So not only in communion do we remember the price of bloodshed that was paid, that we would have our shame and sin covered. But we're invited to remember that we are wearing new clothes. We're wearing our Sunday best. We're wearing our dresses to the daddy-daughter dance. And that we ought to live in the way that reflects the clothes that we're wearing. Uh, so as the elements are, are passed around, please partake and remember not just the price that was paid, but that we get to live as those who are clothed in something much better. Uh, Heavenly Father, I praise you that you not only have forgiven us and paid the cost for us to be clothed, for our shame and our sin to be covered, but God, that you have given us better clothing. You have given us Christ himself. So Lord, would we take these elements recognizing that it's not just a remembrance of the past, but it's a, a calling back to today, recognizing that there's a way in which we are to live, one in love and humility and meekness and kindness and of self-sacrifice. Lord, because that is you. So Lord, may we, may we live as people that in our actions live out what we've been dressed in. Lord God, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. Ooh, I'm loud today. I like that. I sound powerful, huh? Anyway, I'm a little bit upset this morning because my whole um, introduction I, I planned on talking to you about was how excited I was that we sprang forward. Because so if we're, if we're springing forward, that means spring is right around the corner, and then I wake up, and there's snow on the ground. And then, of course, Mike does such a good job of always being so positive, even though it's snowy out. and makes me feel convicted and about my negativity. So we're just going to skip over all of that, and we're going to get right to the fact that today... Our Greek word of the day, let's say, is this word apotheosis. Apotheosis, doesn't it just flow off the tongue? It, it, everything just sounds a little bit more romantic sometimes when you don't use the English words for things. Uh, but apotheosis is the act of taking something that is common and making it divine. Taking something that is ordinary. I know we don't like to think of, of human beings as being ordinary, but something that is squarely not God and, and elevating it to the level of, of deity or this level of being godlike. It sounds like a really big deal, but it's something that's been happening uh, on this earth for as long as there have been uh, men who, who seek to have power. You see, there's always been men who, who realize that being just simply the lord of the land or being the, the governor of the people, maybe even that being king, uh, it's, it's just it's not enough. Right, being a great warrior or, or having great success and becoming a rich businessman, it's not enough real power. And, and they come to realize that, that real power can only be achieved by a, achieving d d d a divine status, if you will. It's the idea that being respected, it's the idea that being revered, it's not enough. Right, that all the people must bow before me as, as my status of God is confirmed. It's actually pretty common. It's happened from, from cultures all over the world for as long as there have been people. Now, remember where we left things off last week in chapter 5. In chapter 5 of, of, of John's Gospel, we got to this point where the, the leaders of the Jews, they were going to begin to levy charges against Jesus. It was verse 16 we read last week. It said, This is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Right? They said Jesus, he, he had done the unthinkable. He had healed a lame man on a Saturday. And this was this grand, like, RICO charge that we talked about last week, that the, people, the, the leaders of the people, they decided they were going to bring against this troublemaker, Jesus. They bring these charges so that the rules of the people, the rulers of the people, I, I should say, that they would keep their stranglehold on the attention they would keep their stranglehold on the respect of the people. But you may have picked up on something, that there's something that doesn't quite add up from last week. So, something happens between the 16th and the 18th verse of this chapter. It elevates everything to a whole new level. Right? We just read in, in verse 16 that they were going to persecute Jesus. But then verse 18 says this. It says, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. All right, so again, verse 16 says we want to persecute him. Verse 16 says we're going to persecute him for working on the Sabbath. But now in verse 18, we up the ante and we say now we want to kill him. And we want to kill him because now he is making himself equal to God. That, that escalated pretty quickly. But again, this is nothing really new. This is not a new and unheard of charge that they are, are bringing against Jesus. And the way that I can know that this is not the first time that, that someone in the history of man had the audacity to claim or to, to seek to be seen as an equal to God is because we have the Greek word apotheosis. It exists. And now that's the modern Greek word. There's an ancient Greek word that I don't feel like trying to pronounce today. So we're just going to go with apotheosis If there's a word from a long, long time ago, it means that there was something in that culture, in the collective understanding of that society at that time, or they would not have made a word for it. Uh, for example, as far as I know, there is no ancient Greek word for nuclear fusion. Uh, do, do you know why? It's because no one had ever heard of nuclear fusion. No one had thought of such a thing, so therefore there was no need for there to be a word. 
But people had certainly dreamed of or, or tried to, to obtain apotheosis before. There's a Greek myth, and whenever I start talking about Greek myths, and I know that Alexander's in the room somewhere, I get nervous because I know he knows these stories better than I do. So if I pronounce these names wrong, Xander, I apologize. But th there was a, a Greek myth about a man named uh, Belephorin, I think is how you say his name, and he was supposedly this, the son of Poseidon. And Belphorin, he was a warrior. Right? According to their story that they told, he, he rode a winged horse, perhaps you've heard of him before, named Pegasus. And Belphorin, he, he won many battles. He slayed many beasts, n none more famous or none more notably, maybe, than when he uh, killed the Chimera. Now, I didn't know what a Chimera was, and maybe you don't, but in, in Greek mythology, it's a mixture of a lion, a goat, and a snake, and it breathes fire. Okay, so killing one of these is a pretty impressive feat. And Belfort, after all of his victories that, that he had achieved, he became very cocky, and he became very arrogant. And what he decided was with the power that he controlled by having this horse with wings, Pegasus, he decided that he was going to take Pegasus for a flight, and he was going to fly to Mount Olympus, and he would take his place among their gods. So Belfort, he, he soared higher and higher. But a fly came along, bit Pegasus on its rear end, as flies often do to horses. The horse bucked through Belliforn into the sea where he drowned. And nothing proves that you have not yet reached deity status more than drowning in the ocean. You see, there's, there's many, many men who have came and who have claimed to be God or have claimed to be God adjacent throughout history. You think of Alexander the Great. He claimed to have achieved apotheosis. Alexander, though, he did not fall from a pegasus, right? He, his life ended at about 32 years old. He succumbed to probably typhoid, typhoid fever or malaria, right? A self-proclaimed God that was taken out by a microscopic germ. Julius Caesar, great power, great wealth, thought to be divine, right? Sixty men plotted against him, stabbed him 23 times, and that proved that he had not achieved apotheosis, we still see things like this happen in our modern day as well. Every so often, these, these cult leaders, they pop up. I was reminded of Jim Jones, right? These charismatic leaders who convince those around them that they are indeed God. And just like the previous stories, how this usually ends is with death, right? In Jones's case, it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound that proved he had not achieved apotheosis. The, the desire to be seen as divine, again, it is not new. We can even go back in Scripture. We can see that this desire to be like God, it is not new. When Adam and Eve, when they fell, when they sinned, they ate the fruit of a particular tree. And why did they eat that fruit? Because they thought that it would make them more like God as they obtained the knowledge of good and evil. The result of their failure, that sin entered the world, that death would now come for them, that it would come for their children and on all that would come after them. Genesis 11, the people of earth, they desire to build a tower. They want to reach the heavens, staking this claim for themselves that, again, they have reached this, this God-like status, this God-like level of success. And where did it leave them but in shambles, being scattered all throughout the earth, proving that they are not God's. So when Jesus, when he comes and he says to the leaders of the Jews, to these religious men who are in charge of protecting the status quo, the status quo that they had come to love, when he says to them in verse 17, he says, My father is working until now, and I am working. See, the leaders, they know exactly how to handle this type of talk. They're going to handle it the same way that this type of talk has always been handled. Because there's only one thing that puts beyond a reasonable doubt that someone is not divine. Right? One way to prove that someone is not God, that he has not achieved apotheosis. And that is his death. So that is why in verse 16 it says, let's persecute him. And then Jesus speaks in verse 17. And then verse 18, the leaders say, never mind, let's kill him. We remember that what Jesus says there in verse 17, again, it's in his response to these claims that he should not have been engaged in work on the Sabbath. 
We acknowledged last week that even the, the, the Jewish leaders, they knew that God himself did not need to take a Sabbath. That God was provider, God was judge, God was creator seven days a week. So when Jesus responds and he says, just like my father whose work is essential and must carry on every day, so must mine. Because of this one statement that Jesus made, they wanted him dead. Jesus had made his point, but Jesus did not stop speaking there. Jesus is compelled to, to elaborate upon this one sentence so that there could be no misunderstanding as to exactly what he was saying. And that's what we're going to focus on today is these next ten verses of dialogue that are given to us from Jesus. As, as Jesus, he just goes scorched earth. He, he reveals the mystery of his divine identity to these men in this moment. Uh, it's verses 19 through 29, and we're going to read this straight through. Get a sip of water before I try to read this straight through. It says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I wanted to read all ten of these verses together because together in context, they're absolutely crazy. If you stop and think about this, Jesus is standing in front of the leaders of the people who have already decided to persecute him. They've already revealed themselves to him as being their, you know, his enemy. He already knows they want to bring him up on these propped up RICO charges. And instead of defending himself against the, the charges that have been brought against him, he stands up in front of all of his accusers and he admits everything. I picture like Tony Soprano at his racketeering trial, right? The state has brought these charges against him of money laundering or, or fraud or conspiracy, right? But as the mobster stands up, instead of defending himself against those charges, charges that would already put him away for the rest of his life, he, he says, if you thought that was bad, right? Let me tell you about all the drug deals. Let me tell you about where all the bodies are buried. Let me confess to you the things that you think you know about me but you cannot prove. I'm not comparing Jesus to Tony Soprano, mind you. Don't let that be your takeaway from the day. But I just want you to grasp how much, I'm going to use a Jewish word, chutzpah, right? How much bravery it took for Jesus to, to demonstrate, how much he demonstrates here. These powerful men are already out to get him. And as he speaks, he gives them all of the ammunition that they would need to throw the book at him. What all starts with this charge of working on the Sabbath as he healed a man, as he commanded him to get up and carry his mat and walk home. In verse 17, Jesus makes a shocking confession. He says, my father is working until now, and I am working. That one simple sentence, there's already no misunderstanding as he starts this confession. When he says Father, they know who he is talking about, that he's talking about the God, uh, God the Father in heaven. 
When he says son, he knows that he is ref- they know that he is referring to himself. And then we see how forceful and authoritative the allusions and the language that we hear Jesus use. Again, he, he makes it perfectly clear. He knows what he is saying. He knows what the implications are of what he's saying. And we can simplify it a little bit if we look at each of these verses just to make sure we understand exactly what it is that Jesus is claiming to be here. We'll call this like the Daniel translation maybe, but but John 5, 19, we'll put it back up on the screen here. Very simply, what, what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, I can do nothing of my own accord, but only what I have seen my Father doing. Verse 20, Jesus says, God loves me. He shows me everything that he is doing. Verse 21, he says, God gives life and so do I. Verse 22, he says, God will not judge, but he's given that authority to me. Verse 23 says, all should honor me as they honor God. If you do not honor me, you can't honor God because he's the one who sent me. Verse 24, I don't think even needs any clarification. He says, whoever hears my words and believes, uh, believes him has eternal life. Verse 25, the time is here now when the dead will hear my voice and those who hear will live. Verse 26, God has life in himself and he has given me the same power. Verse 27, God has given me authority to judge. I am the son of man. Right, you can remember that this term, the Son of Man, this was something charged. This was something that all the people would have been familiar with from Old Testament scriptures. Verses 28 through 29 are, are an utterly stupendous and absolutely absurd claim for anyone to make if they are not divine. He says, there will be a time when the dead will hear my voice and they will resurrect to life. You see, these are the statements of a man who is boldly proclaiming apotheosis. And they're statements that the leaders of the Jews, that they could not ignore. They're statements that would have to be dealt with. They could do only two things in response to what they had heard. Right? The only thing that they could not do in this instance is to ignore something that was so bold. The two choices that Jesus left them with when he gave this, this powerful confession, it would be first off, A, they could believe that this man who stood before them in this moment was the Son of God, the awaited Messiah. Or B, they could decide that this was just another crazy man trying to claim some apotheosis for himself. And if they went with B, the one way that they could prove that he was not who he says that he was would be to, to, to prove the limits of his humanity. Right, they decided that they would have to force him to face the undefeated champion of every false deity that had ever come before him, death. So, so that is why in verse 18, they are now seeking to kill him. He was making himself equal with God. He said, God had sent the Son to the earth. God empowered him. God entrusted him. But to those whom he was sent to seek, they wanted to prove his humanity by ending his life. If you recall, one of the things I mentioned before that makes the Gospel of John a little bit different than the, the synoptic Gospels that we have in our Bible is that God does not, or I'm, I'm sorry, John does not record any of Jesus' parables that he tells. Uh, But as I read this part of of chapter 5 this week, I was reminded of a parable uh, that is recorded for us in the other three Gospels that we are provided with. It speaks directly to what we just read today. Uh, So we're going to take a quick detour today to the parable of the tenants uh, as it's told in in Matthew. Uh, It's Matthew 21. And in Matthew 21, Jesus tells us of a man who owns a piece of land. And on his land that he owns, he, he plants a vineyard. It says that he takes the time and he he puts a fence up around his vineyard, that he digs out a wine press so that this this area of land, it's all ready to go. uh, go. It's ready to produce a crop. And, And he entrusts his land, he entrusts his winery and his equipment to to chosen tenants. 
And there's an agreement, right? He provides them with this unique opportunity to work his land, to harvest his crops, since he would not be there to do it himself. And, and the tenants that he chooses, they gladly, they accept this offer. When it finally comes time for the harvest, he sends some of his men to go and collect upon the agreed-upon portion of the harvest. Yeah, we'll pick up the scripture in verse 35 through 40. This won't be on the screen behind me, but you can follow along in your Bible. You can look it up when you get home. Matthew 21, 35 through 40. It says, The tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent out other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those tenants? You know, God had sent many servants to the people over generations. He sent many servants to these people whom he entrusted with his vineyard. Very few of them were ever greeted universally with love and respect. Many of them ended up giving their lives in service to the king. Most recently, we can think of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. John came and he told Israel to repent for the time of, of the Messiah is near, and it cost him his life for his trouble. And then just like the parable says, the master, he sends his son, saying that they have not received my servants, but surely they will respect my son. They wouldn't dare to treat my son the same way that they treated my servants, would they? And now here in this moment, the leaders of the Jews are standing face to face with a man who says, I am the son of man. A man who is saying to them, the father has sent me to collect upon what is his. And, and the people, they behave exactly like the ungrateful, dishonest tenants. They completely forgot whose property it was that they were tending to all these years. They, they forgot that it was the master who selected them to work the land. They see the son that is here standing before them as a threat to their plans. So now they're seeking all the more to kill him. Because in his death, that would prove who this blasphemer truly was. And little did they know that they were right. The plan that they would put into action absolutely would go down in history as what would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt if Jesus was indeed whom he claimed to be. It's not a spoiler alert, is it? We know that they would get their way. We know that they would kill Jesus. And momentarily, these, these evil and these corrupt tenants thought that they had proven that Jesus of Nazareth was certainly not divine. Right? No apotheosis for him. Because the truth is, if I can go and I can visit the place where your body lays, you are not divine. You are not a god. See, but they did not understand that without death, there could be no resurrection. Jesus dared to make these, these powerful, confident statements that we read today to the faces of these men who, who could harm him because he was wholly devoted to the will of the Father. Jesus made these statements because he was not afraid of the consequence nor the cost. He, he knew that his Father in heaven had a plan that was better than, than any one that men could have scripted. So Jesus, he, he spoke with confidence knowing ultimately that his fate was in the hands of the Father, not in those that who, who could simply harm the flesh. His fate would be in the hands of the one who created men, who, who set the stars in the sky, who told the waters where they could rush. The only one who had authored the end of this story already. And I know that that is easier to say than it is to do. I understand that, that Jesus, as he stands here, he is the Son of God. I understand that Jesus, in this moment, he, he is divine. But those aren't excuses for us to, 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 to look at the confidence of Christ as something that is only set aside for him or only set aside for, for his godliness. That that can't be for us. 
Right, those of us who call him Lord, who, who do express a desire to be sanctified, to be made more like him every day, what would it take for us to have the same faith and display the same confidence? Right, to look into the eyes of maybe someone who can cause us harm financially or cause us harm personally or physically and, and still say with confidence that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God. I believe that he gave his life and resurrected so that I can experience eternity in heaven with him. Right? What would it take for us to be able to say that, not just within the relative safety of these walls, but to say it out there in a world where people might think less of you because of it? To say it to people who might bloody your nose because of it? Why would we do such a thing? Because that's what Jesus did. He knew that the men who challenged him, who, who plotted against him, and who would kill him, were the very same men that he came to die for. Jesus did this because, like us, he knew the end of the story that was coming. And before you say, well, that was easy for him because he was God, again, consider your own confession that you have made. If Jesus is your Lord, if he is your Savior, if you have placed your faith in him, why in the world would you not believe his promises? Because what Jesus says himself here in verse 29, he says, those who have done good will be brought to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And in John's gospel, when you hear terms like doing good, it almost always refers to believing in the one whom God has sent. And in John's context, the ultimate evil that anyone can commit, right? it's not carrying a mat on a Saturday, it's rejecting the one whom God has sent to collect on his vineyard, Jesus. Right? Your Lord says that, that he will return for you. Your Lord says that you will be raised and that you will experience eternal life. But still, we, we focus far too often on getting the most out of this life, on building treasure where it says where, where flame or moth can destroy. Right? We find it not even hard to be bold in the face of persecution. We find it hard to be bold in the face of a simple question. Truthfully, though, while there is conviction in this scripture for us, this is not a scripture of doom or gloom. It's a scripture of great hope. It reminds us that all who call upon the name of Jesus as Lord will experience a resurrection to life. And not just a life that is regenerated into this broken world that is full of pain, but a rebirth into a life in a place where there are no more tears where there, are no, there is no more suffering. This offer is extended to everyone who can hear me. And the same way the leaders of the people, how they had two choices in front of them in this moment, the fact is you do too. What you cannot do, do is ignore this. Right? You must decide, if you believe in Jesus, will you believe in Jesus? Will you believe in his claim of apotheosis? Or will you reject him? Because again, there can be nothing in between. Jesus laid down his life, right? Not to prove a point to these men. Jesus laid down his life so that you could be redeemed and you could be saved. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for the example that is left for us today of the boldness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the example that he left of his willingness to, to speak truth in the face of those who would harm him. Father, help us to be bold. Help us to be bold, not because we're tougher than the next guy, Father, but because we truly believe the promises that you have made to us in your word. That those who have come to place their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior who have been baptized, who have come up out of the water clean and made new, Father, that there is a resurrection to life. Father, help remind us that there is nothing that this world can do that can separate us from your love. Remind us that we are not the lords, that we are the servants. 
that we are tending to your vineyard. Father, when you return to collect what is yours, it will be a joyous day. Father, again, we pray that we would be bold in the face of opposition. We pray that we would show love to all of those, even, even those who wish us harm, Father. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. today, you may have noticed that there are a lot of announcements on the back of it. I'm not going to run through every single one, but please pay attention. Uh, first off, you do have inside your bulletin today a little card you may have seen, a little invitation card for our Easter service. So I would encourage you to share that with somebody who you would like to worship with on that day. Uh, we have plenty of extra cards. I'll be handing some out in the foyer. So if you want to grab a few extra for work or school or to hang up at the post office or library, please do. Uh, I do want to point out the youth fundraiser that was being scheduled for today that is going to be postponed. So we will get a date for that in the future. It will still happen. 
Uh, with our youth programming as well, I also want to mention we're going to have a time change occurring with that on Thursday night. Uh, both our elementary and our middle and high school programming midweek will now start at 7 p.m. instead of 6 p.m. So just to make a note of that, if you are uh, planning on coming out and uh, having some fun with us on Thursday nights, 7 to 8.30 will be the time for that uh, going forward. Uh, ladies' breakfast sign-up is happening. Uh, well, the sign-up's happening now. The breakfast is happening next Saturday at 9.30. So ladies, please get your name on there. Uh, as we have for the last few years, we also will be hosting a Good Friday service here at the church. That will happen at 7 p.m. So we would love uh, to worship with you on the 29th uh, before Easter. Something new this year is we are going to have a breakfast on Easter morning here at the church. Uh, there are two sign-up sheets out in the foyer for that. One simply to attend, and one if you do plan on bringing food. I've been asked to remind you, if you are bringing food and you sign up on that sign-up sheet, still also sign up on the sheet that says you're coming. That way we know you're not just bringing food and leaving. Uh, but I hope this will become a wonderful new tradition. If you have any questions, um, Rob and Lisa, do you want to wave to everybody? Rob and Lisa are going to be handling a lot of the work in the kitchen there, so please see them if you have any questions as to what might be needed. We do also plan on having an egg hunt on Easter after church. That means we're going to need some candy. So next Sunday, if you can pick up a bag of candy when you're at Kroger's or wherever it is you do your food shopping, and you can just kind of fling it into my office, I will make sure that most of it gets to the right spot. <laughs> As always, thank you for being my church family. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Um, would one of you close us in prayer? Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us to come and worship you, Lord. We're so thankful for your son, for all that he's done for us, Lord. We're thankful for his sacrifice on our behalf. And Lord, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit you give us that helps guide and comfort and direct us and lead us closer to you, Lord God. We just pray for those that um, need your healing touch or um, that need you emotionally or physically like we all do, Lord God. We're so thankful. And we just ask that you be before us as we go out this day and help us to just take what we've learned, share that information with others so that we can just have more people know about your son, Lord God. Give us the strength, the courage, the words, the impact as we move and breathe and live throughout the week, Lord God. We're so thankful for everything you give us, Lord. And I ask and pray this all in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Creation see.